great Mormon migration to the West and was a homeopathic physician. And he has gotten a hold of great great grandpa's diary. Uh, and we'll be speaking about him. Uh, I expect it will be marvelous. Uh, tonight, uh, we have Erin Finn. Um, she's a bit of an overachiever. Uh, <laughs> the man she's about to marry has also laughed at this, so he, you know, <laughs> should know better. Erin uh, is a uh, summa cum laude graduate from Colgate. Uh, as she finished college, she sort of struggled with whether she wanted life as a bench scientist or a life as a clinician, and went off first to NIH and then to CHOP, uh, where she did bench work uh, for a few years, a couple of years. Two years. Two years. Uh, before coming here. Uh, she has been part of the uh, medical education pathway. Uh, I see Dr. Fong in the audience. Uh, she has lectured on mosaic genetic disorders to them. Uh, part of the medical humanities pathway. This is sort of the uh, crown jewel, I expect, of her medical humanities involvement. She has been involved with uh, Alternatives for Battered Women, with You Are Well. Uh, in addition to everything else, she's a bit of a jock, so she runs, she plays soccer uh, in her spare time. Uh, she has matched the University of North Carolina uh, in med -Pedes. Uh There will be a commuting relationship. George is heading for the Army and Fort Bragg, which is called something else. Womack. Oh, Womack. In the hospital of Womack. Uh, in family medicine, and they will actually be within 80 miles of each other. Something much closer to the <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Dr. Guttmacher, and thanks to the Corner Society for letting me speak here tonight. And thanks for all of you for coming out. I think when I pictured this talk in my mind, there were five people sitting here. <laughs> this is quite a bit more, but it's really exciting for me. So the title of my talk is The History of Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man from Freak Shows to Genomes. So obviously I'm going to be talking a bit about Joseph Merrick, but the broader purpose of this talk is really to understand how science and social issues interact. And to do that, I'm going to use Joseph Merrick as a historical example of um, someone, a person who had a genetic disorder and was treated poorly by society. And then I want to examine how the field of genetics has advanced over the 130 years since his life. So to do that, first, I want to talk a little bit about how I became interested in the elephant man, just to put this all into context. Then we'll talk about Joseph Merrick, which will bring us to some of the history of freak shows, and then the history of genetics, heredity, genes, and genomes, a little bit about eugenics, and then we'll end up by talking about what exactly was wrong with Joseph Merrick, just to keep you guys in suspense. <laughs> so does anybody know where this is? Colgate, yeah. So this is Colgate University. This is where I went to undergrad. And so I, when I started off at college, I figured I was going to go to medical school because I was, I really liked science and I was relatively smart. And to me, those traits combined to form medical school. Um, and I didn't really know of anything else that I could do. <laughs> but then my junior year, I joined Kenneth Belanger's lab and I got really interested in these things called nuclear pore complexes in yeast cells. And to everybody else, this was impossibly boring, but to me, it was really interesting. So I knew at this point in my life, I should probably figure out if I wanted to do science and do bench research or if I wanted to go to medical school. So as Dr. Guttmacher kind of explained already, I started applying to labs um, to try and fill my year after graduating. And one of the places I applied was the NIH, and they have a post back research fellowship that you can do. And so I was applying around, and a few weeks before I graduated, I got a call from Marjorie Lindhurst, who was a staff scientist at Les Beesecker's lab at the NIH, and she said, we study in our lab the disease that we believe Joseph Merrick had. And she said, do you know who Joseph Merrick is? And I said, no, I've never heard of him. And she said, oh, well, you might have heard of the elephant man. There's, there's a movie about him. And I said, no, I still haven't heard of him. <laughs> but I thought it sounded kind of interesting, and so, I decided that that's where I would go for my next year. And so I ended up in Building 49 as part of the Genetic Disease Research Grant in the National Human Genome Research Institute. And this is where I first heard about Joseph Merrick. 
and I became really fascinated with his life. But these are the kids that I really interacted with. And these are the kids who are believed to have the same disease as Joseph Merrick. And some of them I got to work with, and some of the kids I just worked with their DNA. But it was really the time when I was out of the lab, working with the families of these kids and hearing their stories, that I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Which brought me here almost four years ago, which is still mind-boggling. <laughs> but when I got here, I met a lot of people who would have a big influence on the talk tonight. Um, so first, I was assigned Dr. Guttmacher as my dean, luckily enough. And I took a class with him on the history of psychiatry, which is where we, we talked a lot about eugenics. And then I met Stephanie Brown Clark through the um, Medical Humanities pathway, and she knew more about Joseph Mary than I did. So we had many hours of conversation about the history of medicine. And then I met Dr. Fong, who was our pediatric geneticist, and he's continued to instill in me this love for genetics over the past four years. So a lot of what you hear tonight is kind of a culmination of all my interactions with these people. All right, so this is Joseph Merrick. And when he was 22 years old, he was actually presented as a case report to the London Pathological Society. And so the case that would have been presented was a 22-year-old man who, from um, all accounts, had a normal OB history, was born a perfect baby, but around two years of age started to exhibit this strange overgrowth. And it started in his mouth, and then it kind of grew to involve a lot of different parts of his body, and just continued to progress. He was born in Leicester, England, the son of Joseph Rockley Merrick and Mary Jane Merrick. And again, they, from all accounts, did not have any of the symptoms that he had, and neither did any of his younger siblings, William Arthur, Mary Eliza, or John Thomas. And you can see from this picture that Joseph was described as relatively short in stature. He was only five foot two. And he had, on his right arm, some severe overgrowth. And on his left arm, you can see that it's almost completely normal and had actually been described by um, doctors back in the 1800s as having a delicacy of the um, arm of a young girl. On his back, he had a mass of loose skin that was described as misshapen masses of bony lumps and cauliflower-like growths. And then his skull was also severely overgrown, and he had, um, it was disfigured by bosses of bony material, which bulged forward in great mounds. So Joseph's early years were actually pretty uneventful, until the first unfortunate event of his life, which was when his mother, Mary Jane, died when he was just 10 years old. He would refer to this later as the greatest misfortune of his life. She was really a good mother to him. The second unfortunate um, event that happened was his father remarried, and the stepmother was actually very cruel to Joseph. He would later recount that she had multiple children who were all more handsome than he was, and she made his life a perfect misery. So Joseph was in school until he was 12 years old, um, and then he started work at first Messer Freeman Cigar Manufacturers. And he actually worked there for two years, but that overgrowth of his right arm kept, kept getting worse. And it got to the point where he wasn't able to do some of the fine movements that were necessary for cigar rolling. So at the age of 15, he had to stop doing that. And then his father helped him get a job um, selling goods from door to door, which you can imagine for Joseph did not go that well. He had that overgrowth in his mouth actually made it very hard for people to understand what he was saying. And then when people would see him walking down the street, they would go into their houses and not let him not open the door to him. And so he really wasn't able to sell much, and he would go home to his mom, his stepmom and his dad, and if he didn't have any um, money from that day, then they would end up depriving him of food and sometimes beating him. And so Joseph had a really hard time during his teenage years. He left home shortly after that and lived with his uncle Charles for a very short time, and then he left for good um, when he was 17 years old in 1879. And Joseph first tried to see if he could make any money by, on his own um, out in the world, but really wasn't able to get any jobs. So he became an inmate, essentially, in the Leicester workhouse. And a workhouse in England was something that was under the poor law administration, and it was a place where people could go and live if they were incapable of supporting themselves on the outside. And they were given food and a place to stay, and really had to work very hard during the day. So Joseph would speak of this time as really another, one of the worst times of his life. He would speak of it with horror and loathing. And um, several times Joseph tried to get out of the workhouse, but again was not able to find work. So after four years, he decided he needed to do something to get out. So he had heard that a local comedian, Sam Tor, 
was actually looking for human oddities to display for profit, and he wanted to know if Sam Torr could come meet him in the workhouse and see if this is something that Joseph could do. So Sam Torr came and saw him and agreed that, that, we, that they could kind of form a partnership and display Joseph for money. And that was how he became the elephant man, half a man and half an elephant. Um, and so Sam Torr originally, when they got out of the workhouse, um, started to exhibit Joseph locally in different taverns around Leicester, um, in a, work, in a um, music hall called Nottingham in the Living. But pretty soon, Sam Torr realized that in order to actually fully profit from Joseph, Joseph's appearance, they would have to go on a broader scale. And so he wanted to set Joseph up with someone who would go to England with, or go to London with him. So that was how um, Sam Torr contacted Tom Norman, who then became his manager. And I'll get into that pretty shortly. On the left, I just want to point out, this is a picture that's called a Carte de Visite. And um, they're actually these small photographs that were popular collectibles in the 1860s. And people who were on display for profit, um, so-called freaks, would sell these portraits to get extra money. So Joseph would actually pass this around during his shows. I just want to talk a little bit about society and freaks. So freak comes from the, ter comes from the term lucis naturae, or a freak of nature. And essentially, it refers to someone that doesn't fit into the conventional classification scheme, something that didn't belong. And there were a lot of other terms that people used to, to describe this. There were curiosities, rarities, oddities, nature's mistakes, very special people, and then monsters was another term. That was, interestingly, a clinical term that was found throughout medical journals in the 1800s. It was um, common in the British Medical Journal and the Lancet, and really peaked around the turn of the century. And people, um, infants who were born with congenital defects would be called congenital monstrosities and fetal monsters. And these people who would then be on display as freaks were from a bunch of different categories. There were people with congenital abnormalities, People who just did different things to their bodies, such as extreme piercings and tattoos. And also, people were brought in from different areas of the world and then put on display as undiscovered humans. And I'm going to use the term freak to refer to kind of this general idea of people being on display for profit. Um, I don't mean any offense by it, but just I just wanted to let, um, just state that. The freak show itself was basically a formally organized exhibition of people with physical, mental, or behavioral anomalies for profit and amusement. And the freak show, the heyday of the freak show in England and actually the United States was right around the 1847-1914. However, this, despite that this was the time when freak shows really became profitable and enterprises, this wasn't new to England in the 1800s. Freak shows probably dated back to the 16th century, and at least small exhibits of people. Um, but really around this time, there were a bunch of different reasons why freak shows kind of started to pick up. There was this increasing fascination with the, the demand for these monsters. Um, and there was also new forms of transportation that were popping up that were making it possible for people to tra travel over long distances and transport people to different areas. There was also an increase in the middle class in England, and in an increase in leisure time, and freak shows really appealed to a wide variety of people, a wide variety of classes, and so they became a popular way for people to spend their time. In the United States, in the United States, freak shows also were popping up around the 1840s. P.T. Barnum is one of the most well-known American showmen, and he ran the American Museum in 1841 in New York, and he was also not only popular for exhibiting freaks, he also had a lot of hoaxes that he was responsible for. And in the United States, freak shows typically became really popular around the time of the Civil War because people were trying to find a way to get their mind off of the war and then would go there. The freak show really started to decline around the 1890s, and there were a bunch of different reasons for that. Some of it was um, a lot of people were voicing opposition about the inhumanity of this. Henry Mayhew in England was one of these loud voices of opposition. <coughs> And he actually published, published this article in The Punch, um, which was a satirical journal in London. And it says the deformitomania. And essentially, he was bemoaning the London and England's increased obsession with the idea of deformity. But um, there was also, in addition to 
this out, um, a lot of people speaking this opposition. There was also advances in medicine. They were making it clear that a lot of these people who were on display, some of them had diseases or different nutritional deficiencies, and it removed a bit of the mystery behind it. I just want to show, these are some famous freaks. Um, on the left, it's Lazarus and Johannes Baptista Colorado, and these guys <coughs> actually dated back to the 17th century. They were conjoined twins who were born in Italy, and Lazarus is the one standing up, and he was said to be a very handsome man, and he had his brother, Johannes Baptista, kind of protruding from his abdomen. And Johannes Baptista didn't really interact with um, any people at all. He had his mouth hanging open, his eyes were closed, and he just had one leg that was visible. But when people would go up and rub him, apparently he would squirm around. And so um, Lazarus would kind of travel around Europe displaying himself for profit. And then when they weren't when they weren't at shows, he would wear a big cloak to cover Johannes Baptista up so that no one could see and he didn't attract any attention. General Tom Thumb is the little guy the um, the little guy on the right, and he is his real name is Charles Stratton, and he was actually a distant cousin of P.T. Barnum, who was the man sitting with him. And Barnum had heard that he had this distant cousin who was really interesting because he never grew taller than two feet. And so Barnum contacted Stratton's father and said, let's go on tour. And so as soon as he met Barnum, or as soon as he met Stratton, he started to teach him how to sing and dance and actually impersonate famous people like Napoleon. And uh, the two of them traveled around the United States and then actually a lot through Europe and England and kind of became these international stars in a sense. And interestingly, in this picture, I believe that Charles Stratton or Tom Thumb is five years old, but Barnum thought that it would be even more fantastic if he told people that he was actually 11 years old. And so they would go around and say, this is this 11 year old who never got taller than two feet. And all the way on the right is Jack Earl, who was a University of Texas student in the 1920s. He was also called um, the Texas Giant, and he was discovered at a Bailey, a Bailey Brothers sideshow. And this famous sideshow manager, Clyde Ingalls, actually spotted him and said, how would you like to become a giant? And he would explain that being extremely tall is a matter of physiology, but being a giant involves something more. And this is kind of getting at the idea that it wasn't just a physical difference that made someone famous or made a sideshow um, successful. It, it, a lot of it had to do with the story behind it and the showmanship of whoever was running the show. And this was really true throughout all of the freak shows. Tom Norman, who I alluded at earlier as um, partnering up with Joseph Merrick later, was called the Silver King, and he was kind of the counterpart to P.T. Barnum in England. He was really known for his showmanship and his ability to sell a story. So this is when he had gotten together with Joseph Merrick, he came up with this story that he would say um, before a show, and this quote just says, brace yourself to witness one who is probably the most remarkable human being ever to draw the breath of life. So really making people very interested before he revealed Joseph. So when they first got together, Joseph and um, Norman went to Whitechapel Road in London, and they set up shop in a green grocer shop, and there was this big canvas display outside the show, and it was this kind of grotesque image of a man half turning into an elephant. But right across the street was the London Hospital, and this was a big hospital. There were a lot of medical <coughs> students there. There were also a lot of surgeons and doctors. And um, Tom Norman, sorry, Tom Norman actually did this very strategically. He knew that people in the medical profession, medical students, were really interested in the idea of human oddities. And so he knew that people could easily come over to a show and he would have a steady stream of visitors. And that's exactly what happened. People, medical students and surgeons, when they had some free time, would just wander across the street and see what new freaks were on exhibit that week. And that's how Frederick Treves found out about Joseph. And it's not exactly clear who first told him about the exhibit, but um, he was a distinguished surgeon and, anatomy, and an anatomy professor at the hospital. And so it's likely that he had medical students coming back and telling him 
that he should go see this exhibit across the street. And so he went over one day and paid one shilling to see this to, um, to see the act. And when they first met, because Joseph Merrick really wasn't able to speak very well, Treves kind of made this judgment of him that he was very intellectually disabled. He um, was really just kind of this person who was Norman treated like an animal, and he called him the most disgusting specimen of humanity. Uh, and then at this time, though, Treves really realized that this is something interesting because he knew that Joseph Merrick must have something that never has never been described before, and so he really wanted to figure that out. So Treves ended up presenting Joseph to the London Pathological Society in December of 1884, which is kind of that story that I told you a little bit earlier. Um, and then the way that the freak shows started to close towards the turn of the century, the same thing happened to the exhibits on Whitechapel Road. And so pretty shortly after Joseph showed up at Whitechapel, they started to close the exhibits, the police were closing the exhibits, and it a lot had to do with a lot of shifting public opinion about what was really decent for a public viewing. So Joseph tried to exhibit himself in different taverns for a little bit, but eventually Tom Norman helped set him up with this, this other manager um, so that he could go on a continent tour with the hope that maybe police in other countries weren't going to be as strict as they were in London. However, that wasn't the case at all. There, there really wasn't anywhere for them to go. And in Brussels in June 1886, Joseph's manager actually stole all of his money and deserted him one night, which if you can imagine was a huge disaster for Joseph. He didn't speak the language, and if he did, he wasn't well understood. He didn't have any money. Uh, but somehow Joseph was able to pawn all of his belongings and make his way back to London. And when he got back to London, he really wasn't in very good shape. A crowd immediately stormed him and wanted to see all, wanted to just see this unique person. Um, and so the police actually brought Joseph to a jail. And when they got there, they found that he had this card that had Frederick Trees' name on it from two years previously. And so they contacted the London hospital and they called Treves, and Treves came and collected Joseph, and then brought him back to the London Hospital. And so Joseph Merrick made his way to the London Hospital, where he stayed for about the next four years. And there was a little bit of controversy when Joseph first got there, because really the only people who were supposed to be at the hospital were people who were being treated for conditions that were going to improve. And Joseph really wasn't being treated, he was kind of just being kept there. So Frederick Treves, and also the um, Hospital chairman F.C. Cargum wrote some letters to the local newspaper trying to garner public support for Joseph, and they got enough donations that allowed them to make some living quarters for Joseph in the hospital in a place of the hospital called Bedstead Square, and that was nicknamed the Elephant House. So Joseph stayed here for, again, the next few years, and his life here, from most accounts, seems like it was pretty good. He got to go to several trips to the playhouse. He also got to go visit the countryside. Um, and he and Treves, from most accounts, became really good friends. However, he was still visited by people who wanted to meet this person who was unlike any other person that someone had seen before. And so he never truly escaped the prying eyes of strangers, no matter where he went. There's been a lot of debate discussing Treves and Norman. So these two men who were a huge influence on Joseph's life in different but also at times similar ways. And this also often ties into the morality of the freak show. So a lot of people would argue that it's inhumane to profit from others' misfortunes and it's really degrading to people to be displayed as for other people's profit and for amusement. Tom Norman would argue, and people who supported Tom Norman and the freak shows would argue that these actually provided a means for certain individuals who weren't able to support themselves any other way to make a living and be independent human beings. And so there's kind of been this argument where people see it both ways. Merrick really had no way of escaping from the, the workhouse, and this was his ticket out. Um, and then Norman and Treves both wrote memoirs of their times with Joseph. Um, Treves always claimed that Norman treated Joseph like an animal and that he really degraded him. But Norman would fight back and he would write these articles that said that instead of 
exploiting Joseph. He was really his friend, and he gave him a good cut of the money, and that the hospital exploited Joseph even more than the freak shows did, because he still had to be subjected to these prying eyes of, of strangers and wasn't even compensated for it. So again, Joseph lived there for the next four years until on April 11th, 1890, which was 126 years ago this Monday, he passed away at the age of 27. And he was found at 3 p.m. by a house surgeon and had last been seen alive at 1.30 that afternoon. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding Joseph's death as much as there has been about his life. If you can remember from that picture, his, his head was very overgrown and oversized. And because of that, he wasn't able to lie flat when he would sleep. And so when he would sleep at night, he'd have to sit up and have his head supported on his knees. So the official cause of death was believed to be asphyxiation because they felt that he had lay down by accident or on purpose and that the weight of his head had crushed his trachea. But Treves kind of put his own spin on it and he thought that this was probably Joseph's way of trying to be normal one last time. And he would say that Joseph would always say he wanted to be like other people. He wanted to sleep like other people. And so Treves believed that he had laid down to do this experiment and um, he, so just to quote him, he says, Thus it came about that his death was due to the desire that had dominated his life, the pathetic but hopeless desire to be like other people. And interestingly, Tom Norman also put his own view on the whole thing, and he thought that Joseph did this on purpose and knew that he was going to, that it was going to cause his death because he wanted to escape the prying eyes of the medical community, and this was kind of his last ditch effort. So it's never really, no one's, still no one's really sure what happened to him. In order to understand why people were so fascinated with Joseph, it's important to understand what was going on with science at the time. It was right around the time when Joseph was born when people started to think about ideas of inheritance and heredity. And to go back to that, we kind of need to bring up Gregor Mendel, who's considered the father of modern genetics. And if you guys remember from class, he was an Augustinian monk who did pea exper experiments on pea plants throughout the 1850s and 60s. And he was basically looking at these different characteristics of pea plants these physical characteristics such as the height of the pea plants, the color, the shape of the pods. And he noticed that when you um, bred plants together, there were these traits that could be passed on from generation to generation. And he also recognized the existence of recessive traits and dominant traits. But during this time, Mendel's work was really kind of ignored. No one really took him seriously until 1900 when three scientists independ independently verified his work and basically the age of genetics was born. And there were other ideas throughout the turn of the century about how inheritance was happening, which are kind of interesting. There's this idea of blending inheritance, which suggests that each parent <coughs> contributed fluids to the fertilization process, and then the traits of the parents would kind of blend together and then form the traits of the offspring. Mendel, through his work, was suggesting that there is a transfer of discrete inherited units between generations. And then Charles Darwin believed in this idea of pangenesis, pan meaning whole, and essentially that the whole genetics of the parents contributed to the genetics of the offspring. And he believed in these things called gemules, which were microscopic uh, particles that kind of aggregated in cells and then could mix together during, during um, the production of offspring, and that, that would account for their traits. The term gene wasn't coined until 1909 by Wilhelm Johansson, and that came from the term pangenesis. And I just wanted to point out that Friedrich Miescher was the person who discovered DNA in 18, um, 